The Texas Parks and Wildlife Television Series is supported in part by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, conserving the wild things and wild places of Texas thanks to members across the state. Additional funding is provided by Toyota. Your local Toyota dealers are proud to support outdoor recreation and conservation in Texas. Toyota, let's go places. Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. The white bass run is very exciting because the numbers of fish you can catch. <laughs> Sweet. We need to balance our natural resources so we can be here. It's really about keeping the land home for people. Nowhere else around that you can go and get a view like this. Great vantage point. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. Are we gonna do the biggest fish and the most fish? Yes. It's gonna be a nice day. It is. On a cool spring morning in mid-March, Ray Arquette and his daughters Evelyn and Elizabeth are going fishing. We're on Yewa Creek, which is a feeder creek for Lake Somerville. This time of year, Yewa Creek is a popular spot for a particular fish. We're out here looking for white bass during the white bass run. Uh-oh, I got first fish. First white bass of the day. It's a keeper. It's about an average white bass. They have to be 10 inches to keep. 16 inches is a trophy. We always do uh, first fish, biggest fish, and most fish, so I just got the first fish. The white bass run is very exciting because the numbers of fish you can catch. Number two for me. Got one. Yeah, Elizabeth. Kosis. Got a nice one. <laughs> now I gotta get the hook out. Got one on? Yep, caught a fish, Dad. Nice, nicely done. Bigger than yours. <laughs> the beautiful fish. Look at the sun shine off that thing. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> White bass, also known as sand bass, are fun to catch in rivers and lakes year round. But from January through May, large numbers of white bass make their way upstream to spawn. This annual event is known as the White Bass Run, and it's a fishing tradition for many Texans. We in Texas have uh, some really top-notch, world-class white bass fishing. I got a couple bumps in that little pocket down there. Three main factors impact the white bass run. As the days get longer and longer, the white bass start perking up a little bit and they start moving towards these tributary streams. They like water temperatures around 50 degrees to trigger them to really commit to coming up into the river. And then a little bit of rain, a little bit of extra flow really helps too. There's a nice fish. Nice white bass. Cool to see them in such good health. This one's a really nice chunky fish. A single large female can lay up to a million eggs. We're gonna release this fish. It's gonna go on to make a lot more white bass. I like fishing because I enjoy it. It's like a sport to me. It's fun to see how many I can catch each time that I go. You want to keep your point of your rod low down so when you jerk your jig, it goes straight. Also, keep your line taunt. If the line's not taunt, you can't feel the fish bite. There we go. <laughs> yeah. There we go. Nice fish. Got a nice size white bass. Fishing for white bass is very active. Sometimes we'll fish for long enough that your arms get really tired. Caught a fish. Fish on. Not a very big one. Nicely done, though. I didn't even realize they had a bite at first. I thought I had a snake. <laughs> Evelyn just caught her third fish in this hole. Elizabeth has one out of here, and I haven't got one yet out of this hole. One of the many things I learned from my dad in fishing is to adapt to the situation. 
Sometimes you get to one hole and you might not catch a fish at all, but then you move down to another one and you'll catch five or eight back to back. Does that bend look good, girls, right down there? Yes, it does. Let's go try that. Yeah. I love hanging out with my family, catching fish. It's also just fun to be out in nature. Yeah. Hearing the birds sing in the water run is just very serene. Those are sandhill cranes. Yeah, they sound awesome. I've been taking my daughters fishing since before they could fish. I would carry them in a car seat and <laughs> I'd bring them out to a fishing spot where they could catch bluegill. We'd go fishing and get them catching fish. I've been fishing as long as I can remember. I am very happy that I have a dad that always takes me out. Part of the reason he always takes us out is because he enjoys seeing us have fun. One of the most enjoyable things about fishing for me with my daughters is watching them catch fish. Got a white bass. <laughs> when they light up and you see that smile, that's the success. Got one. Woohoo! Nice job. I'm really looking forward to all the future times I get to come back here and do this with my girls. There's always a lot of things happening in the veterinary world. This cat today, they want to get it fixed, and that's what we're going to do. My name is Chris Grotegut. I am a veterinarian in Hereford, Texas. Oh, feel better, though. Yeah, we'll send him home season. That work? Okay. <laughs> we're a small shop, southwest of Amarillo, Texas. We're the self-proclaimed cattle feeding capital of the world. I don't know if that's true or not. We love the wide open spaces. We run a family farm and ranching operation. Tierra de Esperanza means land of hope. Our deal was hope to make a living. <laughs> when people think of this area, they think vast expanses of dry land. But the other thing this place is known for are the Playa wetlands. <laughs> Tens of millions of waterfowl and other birds that migrate across the United States are 100% reliant on these playas. They are rain-fed wetlands that supply the majority recharge to the Ogallala Aquifer, which in turn is the majority of our agricultural water. Across the Great Plains, we're extracting more than we're putting back in. The majority of wells in the Panhandle are declining. That data is publicly available. The water level is 113.85 feet. The general trend in the region is down, 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 down. Without water, you don't have a community, you don't have a civilization. It's that, it's that simple. We're probably OK on our protein intake. So we got really interested in Playa Lakes. We really got interested in grasslands. We look at those. We found out that there's a really good opportunity here to become grass farmers and they increase our biological diversity and still have water available for our family, our livestock, and some of our crops. In 2010, we started on putting these center pivots that we irrigate with in grass, and we liked it enough, we just kept doing it. Removed a lot of our pivots off of our land, so we reduced the amount of acres that we're actually irrigating. We continue to add grass over the years, and at this time, we're about 75% in grass and we try to have cover on all the ground at all times. Dr. Grotegut, he's got a really good system. You can actually produce off the land. It's not about getting rid of agricultural production or leaving or not taking any water at all, but it's about finding that balance. Dr. Grotegut's land has really started to respond to the work he's already done. Windy day here on the plains, isn't it? It's always a windy day on the plains. Getting these dry cycles in the Playa Basin coming in. Look at these cracks. Imagine how much water flows through that whenever it starts raining again. If the Playa Lake has gone through a good dry cycle, it improves our chances of catching some recharged water. You can really absorb that water and goes in the cracks. Look at those roots going all the way down. You can take in a lot of water in a very short period of time heading toward the water table. We're basically higher than we were 10 years ago on our Oglala level, which is a big deal considering the region on average probably declines a foot a year. So it's really about keeping the land home for people. 
while he's kind of a lone voice right now, is, is not the only voice. People want to do what's best for the land and what's best for their families. And so we hope that that momentum continues. Bye, bye. Whoa. Yeah, you're good. I have two sons. They're 14 years old. Joseph, sit down. I know. <laughs> we need to balance our natural resources so we can be here. The next generation is going to need a drink also. We're very, very lucky to get to be here. Born to support a world war. Redesigned as a world-class cruise liner and then a maritime training vessel. The Texas Clipper is now at her final port of call. The bell ceremony signals the last change of watch for the Texas Clipper as Texas Parks and Wildlife Department takes final command of her. Saved from being cut into scrap metal, it is soon to become an artificial reef, providing needed marine habitat and quality fishing and scuba diving for the people of Texas. But before there was a Texas Clipper, she was known as the Queens. Nineteen forty-four. The war is now going the way of the Allies. There is a huge need to transport troops and weapons to the South Pacific for the fight against Japan. Answering that need is the Queens. She was destined to be a Texas ship from the beginning. Her hull was laid on March 2, 1944, the anniversary of Texas Independence Day. The Queens carried 47 officers and 512 enlisted men on its maiden voyage. Joe Edwards was one of them. I was 17 years old and joined the Navy. I was just country, country boy. And after I took the boot training and all the things, when I went aboard her, it just seemed like a second home to me. We traveled so much, different places. That's, that's what really made it interesting. She left Norfolk, Virginia, and went straight to Pearl Harbor, picking up troops and supplies and transporting them to all corners of the Pacific. One of the first places the Queens delivered troops was the island of Iwo Jima, site of one of the bloodiest battles of the Pacific War. Joe's duty was to pilot a personnel transport. There were so many people killed there that, that they just couldn't take care of everything. And when we were unloading, you'd have to watch to not to hit a body or some of those float, still floating around the edge of it. We had uh, three doctors board our ship, and we took on a lot of the wounded people, and uh, they brought them out, and the doctors helped with the hospital ship there. It took them a long time to get that island straight. The Queens was commissioned near the war's end, so one of its most memorable duties was bringing thousands of troops home. When she was decommissioned, she quickly moved to her next life as the Excambian. In 1947, the Queens was redesigned to carry both cargo and passengers by Henry Dreyfus, the man who designed the radium dial alarm clock, the Hoover upright, and the rotary dial telephone. This was to be a luxury ship with a country club style. Renamed the Excambian, it was one of the four aces, the first fully air-conditioned ships in the world. She embarked from New Jersey and traveled the Mediterranean on a six-week round-trip voyage, 
fares started at $850. It, it was considered back in the 1950s as one of the top of the line luxury ships. It had some of the most elaborate staterooms that existed at the time. One of the cargo holds that we know of now was used as an actual swimming pool. Some of the best service was found on that ship. Life was good and very comfortable aboard the Excambian until the birth of the transatlantic airplane. Now everyone wanted to fly, and the Excambian found herself out of business, but ready to move on to her next life as the Texas Clipper. The Texas Maritime Academy was now in command, making her an ocean-going campus to train cadets for the American Merchant Marine. Texas A&M University at Galveston took over the training program and painted her maroon and white, the only one like it in the world. One of the instructors on board was Dr. Stephen Curley. For a dozen years, I sailed on board the ship as an English teacher. And for 10 weeks each summer, we went out. And I, I suspect when you add up 10 weeks and multiply it by 12 years, you have uh, an awfully long time. I was on board that ship probably longer than most of the Navy people were on board the Queens. The students took classes and worked hard learning how to command and care for the ship, and they traveled the world while doing it. The Texas Clipper went on 30 cruises, visiting ports in countries such as Uruguay, Greece, Peru, and Russia. The Queens never crossed the equator. The Texas Clipper crossed the line four times, and each time there, there, were, there was a ceremony when you'd, you would do things like put some noxious unguents from the galley on people's hair and, and shave them with a wooden razor and, and splash seawater on them to cleanse them. And the, they worked really, really hard, but there was a sense of fun as, and in addition to that. In 1988, Anne Sanborn, a former cadet, became captain of the Clipper making her the first ever woman to be skipper of a deep sea American merchant vessel. The Texas Clipper was more than a ship. She was a teacher. Every ounce of that ship I loved. Ships are the biggest things built by human beings that move. And I think they move, they take care of us, and ultimately they move us in more ways than one. Ships grow old, and the sea stays forever young. In 1996, after 52 years of service, the Clipper was retired, the oldest active ship in the entire American Merchant Marine. After sitting and rusting for 10 years, the Clipper was acquired by Texas Parks and Wildlife. It took a year to thoroughly clean the ship and prepare it as an artificial reef. We've modified the hull for water circulation and diver access. Anything that could float off the ship or cause a marine hazard uh, has been removed. This by far exceeds the amount of effort that's gone into any one particular reefing project. Having received inspections and approvals from the U.S. Maritime Administration and the Environmental Protection Agency, the Clipper was now ready for her final voyage. We towed the vessel out of the harbor. Uh, it was just a sense of elation for a lot of people, especially people who had served on the Texas Clipper traveling the world. This last voyage was a short one just 17 miles out from South Padre Island to her final home. She had not been on the open seas for over 12 years, but she did just fine and was ready the next morning. On November 17th, the anchor was dropped at the location of the Clipper's new home. The final few holes were cut for circulation of water and sea life. The flood valves were opened, and the last man on board was recovered. 
we're watching the ship sink. And at that point, you realize that you've got a 7,000 ton piece of metal there. It, it's just a huge sight to behold, and um, it wants to do what it wants to do. Once we were watching this thing go down, it, it was just very impressive. It, it was the largest thing I have seen happen, and certainly the largest thing I've had the privilege of working on. After 63 years of floating on the world's oceans, the Texas Clipper is now at her final port of call. The ship is going to be home to a new crew. It's the flora and fauna underneath the water. It's just as it was our ship, it's going to be theirs as well. I, I, I say uh, farewell Texas Clipper, farewell Excambian, farewell Queens. Uh, you did one heck of a job and you're still doing it. Celebrating a century of Texas state parks. It looks like you're really looking over the ocean because of the topography. Just a neat place to come. It's the highlight of Big Spring, pretty much. A half hour east of Midland is the West Texas town of Big Spring. This was the only watering hole for 60 miles in either direction, so it was an important spot. The historic spring once drew Indians, the stagecoach, and railroad. The pioneers that came through here would leave their mark. We have one 1888 on up to 1917 and past that. Today, travelers are still drawn to the mountain on the edge of town, preserved since the 1930s as Big Spring State Park. We're right on the edge of the Edwards Plateau, so it's a 200-foot bluff, drops down to the level of the city of Big Spring here. To the north, we're looking at the southern high plains all the way up into the Panhandle. About six miles east of the bluff here is the rolling plains. So you have three ecological regions merge right here in the Big Spring State Park. It makes me happy. <laughs> it keeps you in shape. It's a wonderful place to come, very relaxing, and it gives me a great start to the day. Very good place to come work out. <laughs> Especially in the evening, very pretty. While the vistas offer natural grandeur, the park's roads and buildings, crafted by the Civilian Conservation Corps, also have a timeless beauty. Amazing work, all of it. The CCC structures have weathered the elements gracefully for over 75 years. We've had to do very little maintenance to the buildings, and these buildings have been here since 1934, so that gives you an idea of the heritage and the sturdiness of them. Well, it's kind of a historic place, but it's very pretty, and uh, it's a nice place to visit. It's relaxing to sit perched on the edge of the bluff watch off in the distance and the view. The night vista with the twinkling lights, it's just neat to see those. Watching the town, waking up, it looks so beautiful from here. Some come to take in the panorama, <laughs> others to take a walk or just take a break. <laughs> but every visitor seems to enjoy the view at Big Spring State Park nowhere else around that you can go and get a view like this. Great vantage point.
This series is supported in part by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, conserving the wild things and wild places of Texas thanks to members across the state. Additional funding is provided by Toyota. Your local Toyota dealers are proud to support outdoor recreation and conservation in Texas. Toyota, let's go places.